Okay, let's, uh, let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. Hebrews, chapter 3. The last time we read the first six verses, and we left off making observations at verse 6, which says, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Someone is being told to hold fast something unto the end in order to keep his good standing with God. Later in verse 14, it tells them to be steadfast unto the end. That expression, the end, is going to be part of the key to understanding this verse in this area of the book. I want you to turn back to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew 10, and let's read there, verses 5 through 7. Matthew 10, beginning at verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a gospel being preached that was especially intended for the Jews to receive, called the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Turn also uh, forward to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And let's begin with verse 9. We'll read down through verse 14. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Well, that certainly describes the Jew better than anyone else, although not all nations currently hate the Jew. But there will come a time when they all do. Verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The context there is right in the middle of the tribulation, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And then look forward a page to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and we'll read a pretty lengthy section here, beginning at verse 31. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall they sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. By the way, it's been said that baby goats and little lambs, little sheep, look virtually identical to each other when they're very small. As they grow and get bigger, the, diff the distinctions become more manifest. Verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungered, and fed thee, 
or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. His brethren are going to be Jews. And um, let's continue verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and, and, and a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. There at the end of verse 46, he refers to the righteous. So let me ask, how was someone's righteousness then determined or established? In this text well it's going to have to be by their degree of obedience to all of those admonishments he just he just listed he just went through a whole litany of things that they ought to do and uh, what they ought to do is minister to the Jew under the one of the least of these my brethren if you didn't do it to them you didn't do it to me however if you did do it to them it's the same as if you had done it to me and on that basis you're rewarded but the Bible says for you and I, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For we are his, uh, uh, I'm getting ahead of it, um, For we are his, and then verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you don't get saved by the amount of good deeds you have performed in the past, but you get saved by trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And because of his grace and forgiveness and mercy upon you, your life ought to be then lived afterwards uh, in service to him and in service to, to others, to minister to those in need uh, and, and to try to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ as a testimony and a, as a way of saying thank you to God for what he's already done for you. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, uh, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that washes and regenerates and renews a sinner when he turns to God by the Lord Jesus alone. Apart from anything he could ever do or offer to God as a, a payment or some way of buying his way into heaven. You can't do it. And so there are two kingdoms under consideration. There is the gospel of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now, modern Christianity just assumes that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are just two uh, terms referring to the same thing, some sort of generic or general blessing of God. But uh, the word God is not the same as the word heaven. And the word heaven is not the same as the word God. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, physical things, shall be added unto you. Paul says in Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, those are physical things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom of God is something spiritual you enter into, 
and you can only enter into it by faith. He that it, um, uh, it, Jesus told the, the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can only become a new creature in Jesus Christ by faith, by exercising faith in Jesus Christ alone. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you can um, perform, what deeds you can perform to try and get God's attention. You, you, you know, after we, we read it in the scriptures and we repeat it so very often, you think people would get it, and yet it seems to elude and escape the vast majority of professing Christians in the world. They still keep thinking, well, I forgot to go to church last week, or I didn't read my Bible last week. That's why uh, I had a flat tire on the way to work. I mean, they think God keeps punishing them because they fail to do something. Um, well, you may, if you do something that's uh, contrary to the work and working of Jesus Christ, don't, don't put it past God to straighten you out along the way. But the idea that, well, it's sort of a good karma, bad karma. If I do so much good, then so much good will come to me. If I do uh, too much bad, then bad will come to me. And you have to be in perfect balance. That's a lot of nonsense. Yeah. That's not how God operates. That's how man thinks God operates, but that is not how the Lord God of the Bible operates. Not in this day and age. And so, rightly dividing the word of truth means we have to figure out who the who is Paul referring to when he talks about those who have to hold on to something under the end. And what does he mean by all of that? The gospel of the kingdom of heaven was preached by Christ's disciples because the kingdom of heaven, an earthly kingdom over which Christ was going to rule, was being offered to them when he first came. But for the most part, they rejected it. And the Jewish scribes and Pharisees that should have seen him coming and should have been ready for him and, and understood it, didn't. And they rejected him instead and asked for him to be crucified. But uh, evidently that same gospel will be preached again by tribulation saints left behind after the rapture about the imminent kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and amidst all the persecution from the Antichrist, the saints must resist him and not lose faith unto the end of the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, the king finally comes, that's the, the return of Christ and his millennial reign begins to uh, take over, and he begins to judge the world for how they treated the Jew in the seven years just preceding it. That's what he describes there in Matthew 25. The time that just concluded. Go back, if you will, to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. Daniel 12, and we may finish a little earlier than I thought we would, but I don't think you'll hold it against me today, but Daniel 12, notice there verse 1. And at that time shall Michael, that's Michael the archangel, stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, calls that time the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is what Jesus, how Jesus described the tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's sometimes referred to as Daniel's 70th week because of his prophecy in Daniel 9, uh, this the great tribulation, uh, or here it's called the uh, time of trouble, or Jacob's trouble, because it's particularly uh, aimed at the Jew, and the Jew's worst time of testing and trial. Right now, the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, enjoys great prosperity. They enjoy great success. And God restored that people to a land that he had given to their ancestors, to Abraham, centuries and centuries ago. But uh, by and large, the Jews still do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is a growing number of Jews who are finally having their eyes open. You can find some great ministries 
uh, to uh, expose that, to expound that rather, that there are many Jews turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, not only as their, their Savior, but also as the Messiah. The Messiah that their ancestors rejected, the one their parents warned them against, the one the Catholic Church has misrepresented uh, for 15, 1600 years, and that's why the Jews have been wary and leery of trusting uh, so-called so Christians uh, to be telling them what they need to hear. They've been skeptical of the person of Jesus Christ and his offer to forgive their sins and uh, restore them to their proper place as the, the nation above all nations when he begins to reign and they rule underneath him. Um, God made promises to Abraham and to his descendants by giving him a particular piece of land which they would make their kingdom, their, their inheritance, and then the rest of the world, the rest of the planet, by extension, and God intends to fulfill that. It's never been fulfilled yet. It's only partially seen in that Jews are now living back in Israel, but they're going to be driven from Israel and from Jerusalem once again when the man of sin rises to power, and he sets up an image in the rebuilt temple of himself and then demands worship of himself by the Jew and, and creates and uh, causes the worst blasphemy to have ever taken place inside that temple. Just when they get their hopes up, uh, along comes the man of sin to say, worship me now. I don't, pure idolatry. You know, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel. I, I, didn't, I didn't research this. Some of you can find it um, if you want to, but God says that uh, he would come down upon a city of, or of unwalled villages. And I read a, a Bible prophecy teacher's book saying that clearly all that Bible prophecy has to uh, apply in ancient times because cities today don't have walls around them. But old, in the Middle Evil, medieval ages or over in history, cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invading armies. But if you go to Israel today, you'll see the Israeli wall, security wall, security barriers, keeping the Muslims out and protecting the Jews inside. And so it wouldn't take a great leap of uh, faith to see how the man of sin will come, promise to be their Messiah, help them rebuild the temple and uh, and force worldwide peace and keep the Muslims in their place. And uh, they'll say there's no, re there's no need for the walls once again. They'll bring the walls, tear the walls down and then that's when they'll be vulnerable and exposed to invasion once again. So not only, so, so the, the prophecy wasn't limited to ancient times when cities had walls. It's going to be fulfilled in future times because right now there is a security wall, just like we need a wall between us and uh, Mexico and Latin America for a lot of drug smugglers and gangs and so forth. And, uh, you know, good Good, how they say, good fences make good neighbors. That's your property. Keep it on. Keep everything on your side. And I'll keep everything on my side. Except when they have a loud party till three in the morning, and the sound kind of carries over. You know, that's <laughs> good earplugs make good neighbors too, apparently. And uh, so it's not a great leap of faith to see how the Jew would be lulled into a false sense of security and tear down those security walls throughout the nation and uh, leave himself open and vulnerable, vulnerable to invasion once again. And they'll be fleeing for their lives when the man of sin turns on the Jew in the temple and says, now worship me. And then he just gives freedom to all those uh, Islamic uh, nations and Roman Catholicism. You know, after the rapture, the Pope will still be here. The Catholic Church will still be here. The Islamic religion will still be here. None of them are going up in the rapture. They're as lost as a golf ball in a tall grass. And they're all going to be here after the rapture, wondering what happened. And they'll find some way to attack the Jew and to, and to uh, blame the Jew for all of their problems. You know, there are, there are some vicious groups now that want to blame the Jew for every economic problem the world suffers right now. Every war that's fomented and instigated, they say it's somehow the Jews' fault. It's not, but there are people who look, look for a, an easy uh, scapegoat, an easy person to blame for their own problems. 
and there, there, are, there are farmers in the Midwest and the central part of the country here who have been con convinced and talked into blaming the Jew for their economic problems, why their, their um, farm equipment is so uh, high and the interest rates on things are so astronomical high because Jews control the banking system in New York City and so forth. And there are people, when, when their backs are against the wall, look for someone else to blame. But you can't blame the Jew for all the problems in the world. That's just, that's so simplistic thinking and simple-minded that it's idiotic. But uh, Daniel 12, verse 1, said there'd be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Look at verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So the expression, unto the end, found in our text, Hebrews 3, is going to have to be the end of the tribulation, of which you and I will have no part. I'm not planning to be here. And uh, if I find a verse that says, I can't lose my salvation, and then find another verse in the Bible that says, I can lose my salvation. I can't make the Bible contradict itself. The Bible never contradicts itself. The contradictions are actually in the minds of sinners. Look forward, if you will, at Hebrews 12. Let's go forward a couple of pages. Hebrews 12. And uh, notice there verse 3. Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The contradiction is in the mind and the imagination of the sinner who wants nothing to do with God. But um, if you find a verse that says you can lose it and you can't lose it, you, you nevertheless have to choose. Which verse is right? Which one's telling you the truth? Well, the verses that say that, that I'm fixed and secure are all found in the Pauline epistles. Written, by the Gent written to the Gentiles by the Apostle to the Gentiles, according to Romans 15, verse 16. In fact, let me, you don't need to turn, but let me read that to you. Romans 15 and verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up to the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You were made sanctified, that is, sacred, holy, by the work of the Holy Ghost, not by anything you did. And uh, that's acceptable to God. That's an offering to God that he would save Gentiles who weren't Jews. They had no physical or, or genetic uh, inheritance to depend upon as, as descendants of Abraham. But they get in on the goodness of God and the blessings of God and the promise of eternal life by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this age in which we live is the easiest age in which to get saved. It really is. Because it doesn't require anything on your part except belief, trust, faith in Him and, and in Him alone. In fact, it's so simple that it's missed by the majority of the human race. When you think that if, if, um, if the gospel of salvation, the promise of eternal life, the cleansing of your soul, the forgiveness of your sins, and um, your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, which can never be erased, if all of that comes in such through such a simple message. Doesn't it seem, doesn't it stand to reason, wouldn't it be consistent with God to give us his Bible in the most simple form that it could be given in? That is, in your own language? It doesn't require you to go to Hebrew and Greek or Aramaic or Latin and dust off a whole library full of manuscripts. It seems like these so-called Bible scholars believe that that's where God has hidden the Word of God in some 
archive, some library, and a whole bunch of dusty manuscripts and books uh, that have to be revisited and a new translation issued about every five or six years. Do you know that from the year 1900 to the year 2000, that 100 year period, about a hundred different English translations were launched on the market for sale. Some more popular than others. But the English language doesn't go out of date every year. It doesn't go out of date every two years where you have to have an entirely new rendition of it. And everyone basically saying the same thing. We're finally making it available to the man, to the common man, putting it in easy, readable language, and finally communicating the truth of God in language that ordinary folk can understand. The King James Bible was the language of ordinary folks once upon a time. And even in the 20th century, and now the 21st century, most Britons have very little trouble following the King James Bible, following the language and the English of the King James Bible. You have to be talked into disbelieving it and, and to not believing. You have to be talked uh, into doubting it, questioning it, and thinking it's not sufficient, it's not accurate, it's not adequate to meet my spiritual needs. I'm working on a sermon God willing, in a couple of weeks, that deals with the power and the authority of the King James Bible. I'm going to give you, I'll give you a little preview. I'm going to try to title it, The Best King James Sermon Ever. <laughs> and I'm going to make my best effort to preach the best sermon I've ever preached on the best book that's ever been written. And uh, we'll see how it works when we get it on YouTube. Of course, I'm going to add a whole bunch of extra taglines and link it to just about everything. You, know? <laughs> you look up, you know, French cooking, it's going to link you to my video. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. But it, uh, And God's given me a whole bunch of new material to include in it. Some things I'm, I'm, I think you'll be actually surprised to hear when I read them to you. But it seems that it stands to reason. It seems to me that it would stand to reason. God... Uh, if he saves men on such simple terms that he would give his word to men in, in the simplest form he could possibly make it. I was over at the 99 cent store yesterday buying razor blades. You can, you know how much I spend on my shaves, right? And um, there's only one book, for one Bible for sale on their, uh, you know, that aisle that has coloring books and crayons and says that they always have Bibles. And it's the King James Bible. Go down to the Dollar Tree store, they have a King James Bible. Go to the Dollar General store, they have King James Bibles. It's the only Bible for sale for a, for a dollar or 99 cents. All the others are, in, are on the market to make money. They're not interested in men getting the Word of God because they're going to replace it with another one in about five years. They always do it. But the King James Bible is the most accessible, the most available of any version of the Bible in the world. The King James Bible has sold more copies and more copies of it have been distributed than any other book in any other language in the history of planet Earth. Well over a, a billion copies have been printed and distributed, not to mention those uh, who have, that have been bought uh, or handed and given away to other people who use Bibles. My grandparents Homer and May Leonard. I don't think my grandfather went past the eighth grade. And my grandmother, I don't know if she even got that far. But they were Bible believing people all of their lives. They're not a, a single thing in the Word of God that they would have doubted or said that's not accurate or this should be changed, that should be altered, and I don't like the way it reads there. They never thought that way. And every morning, they were up, I think my grandma woke up around five every morning. We'd spend the night at her house, her grandpa and grandma's house when we were kids. By the time we woke up at seven, she'd already had the vacuuming and dusting done, and everything was, <laughs> she was already up and been working for two hours, and now she was sitting at the kitchen table listening to J. Vernon McGee, J. Vernon McGee, studying her Bible with him day after day, 
my grandfather, you know, in those days, uh, they had like a tape recorder, like a boom box, and he would listen to J. Vern McGee and tape record every episode. He had all five years of Through the Bible recorded on cassette tapes, which they left to me, but um, and I think we donated it to someone who had a prison ministry so he could use it in that respect, because I, I didn't really need to keep it. But this is how diligent they were, and when they were both gone to heaven, and my folks were um, going through their affairs, all over the house there were Bibles. And every single one of those Bibles had been read through and marked, and their verses highlighted and underscored from cover to cover. I mean, it's like on the dining room table, and the kitchen table, in the bathroom, and the magazine rack, there were Bibles just highlighted and marked all over the place. Go in the guest bedroom, there's a Bible on the nightstand there that they had read and worn out and then got a new Bible. They went through so many Bibles, reading and marking and underscoring and highlighting things that stood out to them and God was speaking to them with. It was just an amazing thing. And um, for, for not having a lot of formal education, they had a lot of good sense. They had a lot of common sense. And they knew what a sinner needed was to trust in the Lord Jesus alone. And that God made the, the Word of God as clear as He could make it and put it in as simple form as He could get it. They never once doubted or questioned the reading of the King James language. Or the King James English was never a, a hurdle or a stumbling block for them. You have to be talked into that kind of doubt and skepticism. But, um, so if I find a verse that tells me I'm secure in Jesus Christ and another one that tells me there's something I have to do in order to hang on to it. Which one do I choose? Well, all the verses that say my salvation is fixed and secure are found in the Pauline epistles. The apostle to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. I suppose those verses will apply to me. And here we are reading a book written to the Hebrews. I'm not a Hebrew. I'm a, I know you might say, well, you're the spiritual Jew. You're a part of the Israel of God, as Galatians 6.16 phrases it. That might be true. I might be uh, sharing the same blessings of God by exercising the same faith in God that Abraham did. But I'm not a Hebrew. So in the strictest, most literal sense... The book of Hebrews is going to have to be targeted at Jews left behind after the rapture and during the tribulation. Let's read verse 14 once again. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. The prospective partaker of Christ can still die and go to hell if he's not faithful unto the end. They can do this after being said to be made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And later in Ephesians 6, verse 4. The wonderful thing is, for a Christian today, you can never lose your salvation. Amen? Uh, I can never lose mine. I might disgrace God, uh, God forbid. I might be an embarrassment. I might bring some sort of shame and, and disgrace to the gospel of Christ, the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I might stumble, and I might fall, and I might fail, and I may be weak in the flesh, and I might have all kinds of uh, faults, and, and commit all kinds of mistakes, perform all kinds of mistakes. But I can never lose my salvation. Ephesians 2, 6 says, God hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you are in Jesus Christ... You are already raised up, and you're already in heaven. I know it's hard to wrap your mind around that, that concept, but why doesn't it take 100,000 uh, light years for your prayers to go from here to the third heaven, wherever God dwells? Because you're there now. You're with Him all the time. Morning, noon, night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are connected and in the body of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't take all that time for your prayer to traverse the universe, if that's the way it works, to reach heaven, because you're with him all the time. And not only that, but 
Suppose, suppose, um, let's take, uh, I'm going to make up an illustration, try to illustrate the body of Jesus Christ. Let's say we were to put a bunch of little paper cups, like those little Dixie cups, all over the floor. And then I was to take a bucket of water and just swash it onto the floor. That water spreads out, and every single one of those cups is wet, right? Think of the water as the Holy Spirit. And every one of those cups is every, every believer. Because you and another believer have the same Holy Spirit living within you. By the Holy Spirit, you're, you're connected to each other. You follow? Mm -hmm. And of course, it stands. Of course, it's it's logical that some cups may have more water in them than the others, right? <laughs> Depends on how how drenched they get with it, how soaked they get with it, uh, how how full of water they might have gotten uh, at the time. But that let that cup sit there long enough, and the whole thing will be soggy. That's what you want to do. You want to think of yourself as joined to every other Christian, because the same Holy Spirit lives within each of you. And the same Holy Spirit uh, joins every one of you together and reaches all the way back to the third heaven. So, there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. This bothers the liberal Christian. This bothers the unsaved man. You mean to tell me that if Adolf Hitler, with all the things he did, got saved, somehow all would be forgiven, he'd go to heaven? Yeah, that's what I mean to tell you. That's exactly what we mean to say. That's a drastic way of of illustrating it, but it's nevertheless true. Once a person is saved, he's saved. He's not just on Amen. a temporary reprieve. Praise he's God. saved. Amen. And thank God for that. You can never lose your salvation. I know we dwelt on one, one verse today, and God willing, next Sunday we can progress a little farther, but I thought it was necessary to take the time out for that. The end has to do with the end of the tribulation and somebody holding out uh, where salvation will not be guaranteed uh, for eternity and automatic for eternity during the tribulation. Once that time begins, the whole different gospel of the kingdom has, that requires good deeds. Now, because it will be coming after the church age, which was a salvation by grace, then there's going to be that element of faith and good works coupled together, which we read about in the book of Revelation. How much good works, how much faith, we don't know because we don't plan to be. 